Hello everyone. Well, today is our last lecture in um, in the semester, and uh, this has been the series on Baroque arts in uh, in Europe, and we're going into the 18th century, which is called the late Baroque, particularly in France. Even though we will look at um, some paintings which uh, belong just in the 18th century, in the typical for the 18th century, as opposed to the late Baroque. Um, but we're going to France first, where uh, the style in the 18th century will be called Rococo, which comes from a French word for something very ornamental, very decorative, uh, all sorts of shells uh, combined with pebbles, combined with acanthus leaves in, um, in, in furniture, in minor arts. Uh, which actually began in um, the 17th century already, but then it spilled out into major arts as well. The um, 18th century will be, uh, in fact, clipped at, uh, at the beginning and at the end. First, in the beginning, by uh, the great longevity of um, the Sun King, Louis XIV, who, who, will, uh, who did live uh, for something like 80 years, out of which he was king for 70, 70 of those 80 years. He will outlive his son, his great son, ultimately Louis the Fifteenth will come to the throne, who will be his great-grandson. And, of course, at the other end of the 18th century, in um, 1879, there will begin the French Revolution. So, as I said, the 18th century will be clipped at both sides. However, once finally Louis XIV did die in, um, in the year 1715, his heir to the throne, his great-grandson, was a child. And as a result, the regency went to his uncle. And, um, well, the uncle had a very easy attitude to life, uh, not to say frivolous. And that pretty much set the, um, the mood for the century until the revolution. Because even when um, Louis XV will ultimately assume responsibility, he will continue in the same mood of, um, well, frivolity. And um, all the more so because the years under Louis XIV, the 17th century, were very regimented, very um, well, harsh, yes, quite totalitarian. Everybody had to go step to the order of uh, Louis the Fourteenth, and that was felt in the arts, and that was felt in minor arts. Not to mention, of course, politics and administration. Uh, the treasury was empty because of all the wars, but um, but the uh, the new uh, the new king and uh, the New Times uh, were so happy finally to divest themselves of that uh, regimentality, of that strictness, that uh, they just went all out into, into happiness, into frivolity, licentiousness often, and that too will very much be seen in the arts. Here we have uh, Louis XV, known, known as Louis the Beloved, and Louis Le bien -Aimé, the monarch of the House of Bourbon, ruled France from September 1715 until his death. And he succeeded his great-grandfather Louis the Fourteenth at the age of five. Until he reached maturity in 1723, his kingdom was ruled by Philippe d'Orléans, uh, the region of France. And the death of Louis the Fourteenth, as I just told you, led to a period of licentious freedom, commonly called the Regency. Uh, the uh, painting towards Fête Galant, theatre settings, and uh, the female nude. Now, Fête Galant was something that uh, was a new genre. It was introduced by uh, a delightful painter by the name of uh, Jean-Antoine Watteau, who, uh, well, uh, who was a solitary uh, man. Uh, and, um, and a thoughtful man. He also early on knew that he had tuberculosis and as a result he uh, 
very much valued happiness and he uh, valued life and, uh, and delights that uh, life can give. Uh, here he paints, uh, this is one of his fifth galant, at uh, the time what, what became uh, very popular for the aristocracy was to uh, sometimes dress themselves as shepherds and shepherdesses and then go on picnics, uh, very um, elegant picnics with musicians and uh, beautiful women with, uh, with their men in waiting with their cavaliers uh, and uh, just enjoy themselves in uh, uh, outside uh, with a beautiful landscape. And uh, here uh, Watteau is um, picturing one of them, an imaginary landscape, a pilgrimage to Cythera, which is the island of love, the island of um, the uh, goddess Aphrodite or the goddess Venus. And uh, as you see, uh, he gives as much attention to uh, the landscape and uh, to the trees, to the water, to the grasses as he does to the people. I, it all becomes one. The happiness of human beings is happiness of nature and it all works together. There are a couple of versions and uh, in one version it seems that the pilgrims uh, come to the island and in this version it uh, seems as if they are leaving the island uh, here is a herm of Venus, or a herm of Aphrodite, the goddess of love, and uh, she seems to be smiling. Uh, there is a bark waiting for the, for the pilgrims to embark, uh, to go back after this lovely time they had spent in, uh, on this island of love. And we see um, one woman and, uh, and uh, her friend uh, looking back nostalgically as if already missing the, the beautiful time they had and then the other couple are still very much uh, involved uh, with each other almost uh, not wishing to go. Everything is done in this very poetic loose uh, brush where again where the trees uh, become the uh, underbrush and the underbrush becomes grass. And then there are some houses out there, uh, mountains uh, that look almost like a mirage uh, that we see in the background. The whole thing, in fact, looks like a mirage. And of course, the beautiful pink putti are flying around blessing the lovers. And it's all Perhaps I said it's already uh, very poetic, uh, in a way mystical, uh, introspective, and just full of warmth and love and uh, nostalgia. Um, here is the uh, close-up, here is the our couple. Uh, the lady is looking nostalgically already back at the ones who haven't yet moved. Then uh, a man is helping uh, his lady friend to get up, and meanwhile these um, these lovers on this side are still very much engaged with each other. He was also very much involved with the theatre, very much loved the theatre, particularly uh, Italian Commedia dell'arte, and uh, painted uh, a number of characters from the Commedia dell'arte. The character of Mezzettino was introduced sometime in the 16th century, and the word itself means half measure, presumably, of liquor. And um, this particular character from the very beginning did not wear a mask, whereas most of the characters did wear a mask. And Watteau was very happy to paint him without a mask. Uh, and here he is. He is alone. He was kind of an extension of Pierrot, and, uh, and as such was uh, never happy in love. And we see in the background, uh, it looks like a statue, could be a woman, but either a statue or a woman are not looking at Mezzettino. She is looking the other way, which suggests an unrequited love. Uh, meanwhile, he sits there singing of his love on his, uh, what looks like a guitar, wearing the costume of uh, Mezzettino without the, uh, without the mask, and of course, being lonely. Now, he, um, Watteau did not paint the actual actress. He uh, would uh, ask his friends to put on the, the, the costumes, and then he uh, uh, painted them. As I said, means half measure in medieval Italian. Um, another painting that is quite famous uh, today, and uh, this is, in fact, uh, 
um, an advertisement board that he made for his friend uh, by the name of Gersa, who had a little shop on one of medieval bridges and it didn't look nearly as big as it looks here. And it was a shop, he was a dealer, he, uh, he also, I think, uh, dabbled in painting his, himself. This advertisement is very large, the board, and uh, well, it served as an advertisement for both the shop and, of course, Watto himself. He uh, takes away the, uh, the front wall and uh, we can walk into the shop directly from the street. There's a dog here and some hay, and what immediately one sees, because even though it's on the left of the painting, but it's forefront, is uh, a man packing in the, a portrait of Louis XIV. Louis XIV is now dead, he can be safely packed away, and that is what's happening here. And uh, whoever is around uh, is kind of looking at it askance, uh, indicating that uh, it's been a long time, and, uh, and no, it's uh, no better time than now. Thank God he is gone. Um, the painting, as I said, it, it's done in two parts. And uh, originally, actually, it was, uh, it was done uh, as an arch here. But then these pieces in the corners were added later by somebody else. You can see an arch here. It shows one lady walking into the shop as a very well-dressed man is uh, helping her. Uh, the figure is now painted very, very long with a tiny, tiny little head. So even if these people, and of course 18th century people were not tall, they were what, the average height was about perhaps 5'3", 5'4", five, 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 even for men. Uh, but they look very tall because the head is made as uh, one ninth, one tenth of uh, of the entire torso, and as a result, the figure looks very tall. Also voluminous because of the beautiful stuffs, because of the beautiful dress that um, she wears. And another lady is sitting here. Very, very dainty little foot is showing, just a tiny little bit. And still another man. At that time, they were wigs and still another man is uh, looking at the painting and a woman while uh, the two shop assistants or perhaps one of them is Gersai himself and maybe his young wife are showing something to the lady. All the walls are covered with paintings and the majority of those paintings are nudes. Most of them female nudes, uh, some of them somewhat more licentious than others, uh, but then others are copies perhaps of uh, the famous nudes such as uh, Titian or Rubens. Of course, Rubens was uh, all the rage at the time, and 18th century saw the uh, accumulation of great collections. Um, it began in the 17th century, but it continued in the 18th century. So a shop like this would have, in fact, people of high rank coming and, um, and buying paintings. Uh, here, is, um, uh, here is the a detail. So there's uh, Louis XIV, fortunately, being hidden in uh, his box. And the lady just uh, looks askance at that. Uh, we can almost feel with her back, thank God, that is over. As they proceed, you, you see a couple of nudes in the background there. A clock, a beautiful clock, also being sold and she wears beautiful shoes, everything is beautiful. This is, of course, the upper classes who are buying these um, paintings. Uh, another uh, person from um, Commedia dell'arte, and that is Pierrot, who is, um, who is always portrayed as a fool and uh, in love with, uh, with a girl who, of course, also does not return his affections, even though he's standing here all by himself and looking at us we are placed in the position of a viewer looking at him on the stage from down up and he looks at us sadly uh, without a smile even though he's supposed to amuse us that's what his role is uh, the sleeves are extremely long and he often runs around the stage just uh, swaying his sleeves that are now gathered together and uh, he is about to recite but despite his um, being alone on the stage, there are others of uh, the, of the uh, company. Here perhaps is Columbine, 
is the girl he is in love with, but she's not in love with him. And uh, the company of actors are pre preoccupied with their own uh, business. There is uh, a donkey there, and everybody is laughing and uh, having a good time, while, of course, Piero is sad, which is um, his role in life. And um, you know, knowing, knowing what thought, perhaps he, uh, he saw deeper into, uh, into him uh, the, the idea of a sad clown who must perform for the audience, but in fact has the depth of sadness within him. The um, composition is really stunning. I, I mean, Pierrot dominates the entire stage. So even if his position in the Commedia dell'arte is that of a fool, he certainly is not presented as such here. He presented is as very much the main figure. And he too is painted without the mask. The most important woman during the reign of Louis XV was Madame de Pompadour. She was um, his mistress. Uh, she was an extremely clever woman. She, was, she always made sure to be great friends with Louis the XV wife, who was Madame Lischinska. She was Polish. And um, she exercised great influence uh, in politics, certainly in the arts. Here she is, and she's painted by Francois Boucher, who will be essentially her court painter. Uh, here she is presented as uh, Diana the Huntress by still another painter of the 18th century, whose name is Jean-Marc uh, Mathieu. And um, this type of painting, it's called the Dispitiem, uh, the type, which is 18th century type. Very elegant, um, very feminine, very porcelain, uh, with a great deal of uh, ornamentation and decoration, yet all subordinated to form, particularly in the case of Boucher. He was a brilliant draftsman, and frankly, his drawings are not inferior to the likes of Michelangelo, Leonardo, etc. And, and, et but of course his art was looked as uh, by the next generations as frivolous and as a result he can't be on the same level. And it does often look frivolous, but it also is very, very delightful. It truly exemplifies this uh, communal sigh of relief after the death of Louis XIV and the loosening of um, regimentality, or the loosening, yes, of manners and uh, just being able um, to have a good time, which of course was all uh, very much subordinated to, uh, to ceremonious behavior under Louis XIV. And ceremonious behavior can become very tiresome after a while. Uh, this is just a typical Boucher spilling with spectacular color, porcelain surfaces, porcelain um, skin, and here sits, uh, well, it's called the Toilet of Venus, and this is something that was, um, this is the, the type of painting was very popular at the time, beloved by, um, by Madame de Pompadour. Here she sits in all her girlish glory, uh, surrounded by putty, and surrounded by all the luxuries that um, aristocratic taste and aristocratic income could, in fact, um, afford. Uh, again, compositionally, it's beautiful. Yeah, she sits right in the middle in this kind of almost, uh, well, I don't want to say Raphaelite, but nevertheless, there's uh, something not far off from uh, Raphael's compositions. Uh, and uh, on each side, the curtain opens up for us to reveal her. Uh, uh, there's a dove here, spectacular bronze vessels, more of it, pearls, flowers, everything is just very feminine and porcelain. And in fact, it was under Madame de Pompadour that, uh, that Sieva, the French porcelain, uh, became so universally desired by the aristocracy. Uh, and now we're going to the more licentious examples of uh, Boucher's art. And, uh, uh, well, she's called the Blonde Adalisque. And uh, mo modern historiography uh, believed that Marie Louise of Murphy, she was um, an Irish girl, was the model who posed for uh, reclining girl, Jeanne Fille uh, Allonger, or Francois Boucher, painting famous for its undisguised eroticism. 
As Madame de Pompadour became slightly older, she in fact um, provided Louis XV with girls from the countryside, and uh, this particular girl was one of them. And now Boucher is uh, painting her in this um, reclining pose, which definitely is uh, erotic. But even before he did this one, he painted um, uh, the Blonde Adalisk, uh, he painted in 1752, whereas this one was about seven years earlier, as you see, in the same position, and presumably um, his wife posed for it. And she's called the Brunette Odalisk, Le Dalisk, or Le Dalisk Brun. And uh, now, even though the term Odalisk itself originally refers to a concubine in an Eastern harem, it is used here as a term describing the sexual and erotic fascination common among Rococo portraiture during the reign of Louis, which also was part of the loosening of manners. Unfortunately, not all of France was convinced by the light-hearted eroticism uh, displayed by Rococo artists, including an artist like Boucher, because 18th century was also an age of enlightenment. It was also the age of encyclopedists. And his harshest critic, philosopher Denise Diderot, which was one of the most important um, encyclopedists, accused Boucher of essentially prostituting his wife, uh, though he himself would later admit, Diderot would later admit, that Boucher's art was such an agreeable vice. And uh, it definitely was. While historians can only speculate on such matters, there's probably a good chance Madame Boucher knew exactly what she was doing. It appears that uh, both uh, Monsieur and Madame Boucher hit on this very lucrative pose, and Madame Boucher was very happy to pose for it. And in fact, uh, Monsieur Boucher uh, painted it a number of times with different faces, depending on what his um, patrons wished. And, uh, and thus uh, collected a very agreeable income thereby. Uh, here's still another one. We can uh, compare this, as you remember, the Rocco by Venus by Velasquez, which, of course, uh, is incomparable to the rest of them, because while eroticism is there, there's also a great deal of elegance and mystery in Velasquez's nude, which, of course, uh, Neither elegance nor mystery are uh, part of the Boucher nudes. Uh, his younger contemporary, who was called Jean Henri Fragonard, uh, painted in, in a similar vein, but often with more sense of humor than Boucher. With Boucher, it was a little more in, uh, in our faces. With Fragonard, it was uh, often more subtle. Probably one of his most famous paintings, the Fragonards. Is, um, is this one, and it's either called The Swing or it's called The Happy Accidents of uh, The Swing. I think there was even a musical that was uh, done with this um, painting in mind. Um, this style of frivolous painting became the target of the philosophers of the Enlightenment, well, just as with Diderot and Boucher, who demanded a more serious art which would show the nobility of men. And, uh, goodness, uh, it will happen uh, sooner than later under rather tragic circumstances after the French Revolution. Um, the lady here is wearing uh, a shepherdess hat, and as I mentioned in the beginning of the lecture, in the 18th century these very wealthy uh, uh, lords and ladies and, uh, and the, the top aristocracy kings and queens, in fact, um, the uh, Embrace the fashion of dressing themselves as uh, shepherds and uh, shepherdesses and um, pretending to be in Arcadia and going on this fed gallant. But not only that, a number of them built uh, on their estates, would build uh, a humble residence, sort of a shepherd's residence with a rather uncomfortable bed. And, um, and they, would call, they would call them hermitages because in those hermitages, they would pretend a simpler life. Uh, that didn't last for long because soon enough these hermitages were augmented and made more comfortable 
And, uh, but the great St. Petersburg Museum in uh, Russia, St. Petersburg, Russia, is called the Hermitage. And the name goes back to uh, Catherine the Great, 18th century, wishing to have her own hermitage as well. And of course, her hermitage ultimately became a great palace. And now, today, is a great museum. So here she is with a shepherdess's dress. She is on a swing that is being pulled by what seems to be an older man, perhaps, or most certainly her husband, slightly older than herself. And what the husband is not aware of is that in the front of the swing, there's a younger man, perhaps her own age, who had assumed a very strategic position looking up and down her skirts as the swing goes up and down. And uh, not only that, but she, in fact, uh, raises one of her legs, throws her very delicate shoe in his direction, and allows him a better view. Uh, there are some sculptures here. Uh, there's one over Cupid, right uh, above the young man, who is um, holding his uh, finger to his lips, not to tell. And, uh, on, and there are two other Cupids, and those are, they're looking towards uh, the young lady, and they are unaware of what is going on here, presumably. Or perhaps it is this Cupid who is telling those little Cupids not to tell. Uh, the uh, Fragonard was spectacular with his um, greenery. Uh, he had this ability to convey this incredibly rich, lush greenery. And it is among this that uh, the light is pointed onto Our Lady, who herself looks like a be beautiful rose in bloom. Again, the composition is spectacular, very, very theatrical. No wonder they did um, a musical on the theme. And uh, she almost looks like a myth appearing from, uh, from these uh, trees uh, to delight our imagination and, of course, definitely to delight um, her admirer's imagination, not that he needs to imagine much. Here she is, there, yes, definitely an older man, as you see here, and two cupids looking up at her. No, they're not looking at him. Uh, here's our other cupid with his um, finger to his lips, and the younger man, his face expressing wonder, admiration, amazement. <laughs> Here it is. And of course the rose is here. She herself is a beautiful rose. The swing is beautiful with a velvet cushion. And uh, here are the trees. Still another French painter, and she was a woman, uh, a very talented painter. Her name is uh, Elizabeth de Gerebrun, who in fact became uh, a favorite painter of Marie Antoinette, who was um, uh, well, the wife of Louis XVI. Both Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette will die under the guillotine. Here, Elizabeth Vigélebrun paints presumably herself with her daughter, and it's just a delightful painting of, um, of a motherly and daughterly love, uh, how the two of them just can't have enough of one another, and uh, they're so close. Uh, both of them are looking at us, but uh, it almost looks as if we've interfered. And this is clearly not done for our benefit, but a very, very sincere expression of mutual affection. Uh, this is Marie Antoinette. This is towards the end of the century. Um, Boucher, Fragonard, were, even though no, Boucher, fortunately, will die before the French Revolution, but Fragonard will survive, will be imprisoned, but um, will be delivered by uh, Jacques-Louis David, uh, who was uh, his friend and uh, will be influential in the French Revolution, in other painter. Uh, here she is. Uh, she is sitting in a room that is um, located right next to that great hall of uh, mirrors for which Versailles is, uh, is so famous and uh, which was copied in all the palaces along, around Europe. Uh, the, um, she has three children with her. Uh, there, is, um, there was supposed to be the fourth uh, and that's why we see the empty cradle, because the little girl died. And that's why we see the black shroud here that is um, 
uh, draped over the bassinet. Uh, the, uh, this boy, who, who was the heir apparent, will also die before the revolution, uh, but this boy will be a little older. So there'll be this boy and um, the girl, and uh, she was Princess Royal, and she will survive the revolution. But uh, the boy will be imprisoned, will be badly treated, and he will he will die. Even though presumably he was uh, once this boy died, and he was supposed to be Louis the Seventeenth, which is why after the revolution was over, after Napoleon, the next monarch will be uh, named Louis the Eighteenth. So the 16th will die under the guillotine, and this one will be Louis the 17th. They will both die, and um, then so the next king will be Louis the 18th. Marie Antoinette is sitting here in state uh, with her three children, and as I said, uh, in the room next to the Hall of Mirrors. Here you can see better perhaps all uh, the luxury of, of course, the, the royal family is apparent but uh, quieted down, not as our Boucher with Venus. Here obviously this is a queen in state but at the same time at home and as such she wears um, uh, a gown uh, that she would wear privately and is surrounded by her children. And here too, uh, this is very much uh, the mark of uh, Vigée de Brun that here mother and, um, and daughter are very close and uh, right here it, uh, it reminds us of, um, of this painting. Still another painter, a very different painter, uh, even though he, uh, he, did achieve, uh, not, uh, he did achieve success and the aristocrats will, uh, will buy his painting. He was very influenced by uh, 17th century Dutch art and uh, particularly the genre paintings and uh, still lifes. And that's what Chardin was comfortable with. He will paint delightful genre paintings. And this is one of the better known. And this is Jean Simon Chardin, and it's called Blowing Bolts. And that's all it is. He shows us a boy in a frame, even though it is actually a window, but out of the window he makes a frame. And uh, the boy is um, leaning out the window into our space. It almost as if we can just reach out, touch the bubble, and uh, have him blown up. Uh, next to him is the soap water, and uh, a younger child, perhaps his brother, looking at it, desirous of doing it as well. And that's really all it is to it. It's this uh, uh, wonderful uh, image of uh, a middle class boy blowing bubbles. It's all really in the virtuosity of portraying this very, very simple scene that gives it uh, almost grandeur and monumentality of sorts. And uh, the way this bubble is painted, it really does look as if it's going to burst this particular second. There's so much immediacy in this painting, even though it's painted with a great deal of discipline, that, um, that we begin to smile just at, by just looking at it and realizing the uh, combination of uh, almost the impossibles that is present here. Here it is, you can see it, and uh, his signature is right here. Here's the boy. The uh, light falls on the boy clearly through the trees. As you see the tree here, the light uh, falls on his, uh, on his uh, right forehead, but he doesn't pay attention. He's completely, totally concentrated. On, uh, on his uh, occupation. A maid coming from the market, bringing foodstuffs and uh, most particularly uh, French bread. French bread is here, just freshly baked. Uh, just as with the bubble, you can almost touch it and you can feel its warmth, you can feel its crust. Uh, but interestingly, however, when you look at the way he paints the maid, it's actually similar to, um, to how Watteau painted his aristocratic women in uh, his advertisement board. Um, it's a very tall figure uh, with a very small head and as such given the same sort of monumentality as the figures were given uh, by um, Watteau. Uh, of course, the aristocratic ladies wear very long dresses. This dress is shorter 
but the little triangular foot is here to emphasize. Uh, another maid in the background, she just came, she is uh, she's just depositing her bread, about to deposit um, her satchel, and kind of looking around almost, we can almost see her thinking, now what do I do first? She is uh, presented against a dark background and as such we can see her all the better. And uh, kitchen still life. Uh, what we see here is a piece of meat, a couple of eggs, uh, fish hanging from the hooks, uh, a copper pot, crockery, just what one finds in, uh, in provincial kitchens. And uh, that's what Chardin truly delighted in painting and uh, in fact became successful at uh, doing it. And then we go to England. Uh, and in England <laughs> there is one painter that had taken upon himself critique of the society, the society in general. And his name was William Hogarth. Uh, and uh, this particular scene comes from a series of uh, paintings that's called the Rake's Progress. Here is our young man who clearly comes from a, a wealthy household. He's sort of a prodigal son. And whatever money he has, he has uh, dedicated his life on spending, spending on, uh, on wine, spending on women, spending on having fun, uh, going to bordellos. And this is what we see here. This is called the orgy. We see him here. He is in a house of ill repute, surrounded by women. There's another man there who is preoccupied with, uh, with a girl. Uh, here on the wall are portraits of uh, inhabitants of the establishment, so perhaps men can come in and uh, pick the one they like. It's often in these establishments called the parade, used to be called. And um, we see these kind of paintings in Toulouse-Lautrec, for instance, in the 19th century, the parade that uh, a man walks in and then all the women recline in um, the reception room or their paintings may be on the walls, and that's what you see here, there are paintings on the wall. And they, uh, this woman is in a uh, half dress or half undress. Uh, that one over there is drinking directly out of the vessel with the contents pouring all, all over her. Uh, there are some more men there who are entering. This may look like a madam or just one of the girls who are clearly very much uh, attracted by this man or rather his wallet and in fact one of the women is um, reaching with her hand inside his dress perhaps for the wallet. He appears to be in uh, the very advanced stages of inebriation. And there are a number of these paintings that uh, Hogarth did which are very unusual for the time and um, nevertheless very characteristic and he shows us uh, the life and as such he also presents a great historical record as well. Here is the same in um, uh, black and white and in fact uh, Hogarth became uh, quite wealthy by uh, through his prints, through the prints of his um, art and uh, perhaps you can see it better because it is in black and white so form shows here without distraction from color. Uh, here is our young man with his two attendants the lady undressing or dressing, nobody pays attention to the mess. Here is uh, some pottery and with things spilled on the floor, there is our woman with the contents of the container uh, flowing all over her and more men in the, in the background. A very different painter of the time, England of the 18th century produced wonderful portrait painters and uh, perhaps uh, the best of them was Thomas Gainsborough. And here he represents a very English couple who live in, uh, in their manor, uh, <laughs> or what today is called in their pile, in the countryside. You can almost see a beautiful mansion from, uh, that, uh, that are used today in period films. And this is this couple who are inseparable from their possessions and inseparable at this time 
from their landed wealth. Um, for the season, they probably have uh, a townhouse, so they go to London for the season, but then the moment the season is over, they go back to, to the country and they are landed gentry. And this is as much a portrait of the couple as of uh, their possessions. Uh, here they are. They are, in fact, uh, newly married, this couple. Uh, uh, we know about them. And a young man, and of course the preoccupation of the young man is hunting, as we see here. And the preoccupation of uh, the young woman is um, minding the manor and making sure everything is um, that, that everything is proper. They sit uh, next to this very, very ancient oak, as ancient perhaps as their family, and uh, this is meant to, to convey the significance of the pedigree of this family as compared to the oak, one and the same. And here is their landed wealth with uh, the pastures, and uh, it might extend as far as the eye can see. Um, really, just a beautiful painting, and even though it seems at first unbalanced because our young couple is on the right, whereas the left is all an open field, it's not. It's not in terms of uh, conveying the, what they are and who they are, because this is not so much a portrait of them, which it is as well, but also a status portrait. And the status, what they are, very much is made up of their possessions and, of course, of the great oak behind them. Also by Gainsborough is Mrs. Siddons, who was the greatest tragic actress of the time. And here he paints her not as an actress, he paints her as a very distinguished woman, and a very beautiful woman, very wealthy woman, looking aristocratic, in fact, because even though in other parts of the world, in France, Italy, actors um, still were considered very much at the bottom of society, in England, uh, uh, already in the 18th century, someone like uh, Mrs. Siddons or Garrick were great Shakespearean actors and, uh, and acted as such and were very much accepted in uh, polite society. And here uh, he paints her just in her uh, beautiful but, uh, but everyday clothes, so to speak as she would go out, as uh, she would receive others. Well, here, perhaps, going out because she has a hat on. She sits on her chair with her fur muff, a beautiful blue dress, um, lovely face, kind of thinking maybe of, uh, of her next role. And Gainsborough brush is very painterly, very featherly, uh, very evocative, in fact, because this is, here is the same woman as portrayed by Gainsborough's contemporary, Sir, Sir Joshua Reynolds, who was very much an academician. In fact, he was um, the first president of the, uh, uh, of the Royal Academy, which was established in the middle of the 18th century. The very first Royal Academy was established in France under Louis XIV in the middle of the 17th century, and then in England it was established in the middle of the 18th century, and Sir Joshua Reynolds became its first president, and an American, Benjamin West, who had come to England previously and made England his home, will in fact become uh, its second president. And with Joshua Reynolds, it was always drama. With Joshua Reynolds, it was um, always magnificence and uh, grandiosity. And this is the same woman that we have just seen portrayed by Gainsborough, and here she is as a tragic muse, and he portrays her as such. Uh, she is uh, sitting in a throne, surrounded by characters from her place, against a very dark background, and the whole theme is uh, the colors are earth colors, they're darks, uh, they're browns and grays and blacks, and only her face and uh, her hands are lit up by a theatrical light and by spotlights. And uh, we see the difference between uh, the two portraits. This is very much Gainsborough, this is very much Joshua Reynolds. Now he painted his in 84, oh, same time really. Uh, there's a year difference between uh, the, uh, 
the two portraits. And now we go to Italy. And the 18th century is also the century of the Grand Tour. At this point, uh, it is considered in, in uh, England and in Germany, and in France also to an extent, that they see on of uh, a prosperous family, of a wealthy family. Either a boy or a girl could not be properly educated without a visit to Italy. And, uh, and therefore, there's this great interest in going to Italy because, I mean, Italy had seen its best days and now had become a great open museum. Also in the 18th century, in the south of Italy, the ancient city of Pompeii that was covered by a volcanic eruption of Vesuvius in the year 79 AD, in the first century AD, in the 18th century that the town was discovered and began to be excavated. And as such, the Pompeii madness began. Everybody wished to see it and, of course, to go to the south of Italy. One had to go through the entire Italy, stopping in Venice, of course, and stopping in Florence and in Rome, and then proceed to Pompeii and then back. So this was a grand tour and was very, very popular, and very, very many people went on a grand tour. Now, at the time, there was no photography, and um, there were no postcards. But instead of that, a number of painters, uh, painters in Rome, painters in, um, uh, in Venice, began to paint these um, images for sale. And one of the most successful one was a man by the name of Canaletto. He came to be known as Canaletto. This, for instance, is a painting of the return of the great boat of the Dar. It's called the Busentor and uh, the return of the Busentor to the Molo on the Ascension Day. And, well, Italians love holidays, they love celebrations, and, of course, the Venetians uh, love them as much as everybody else, and, in fact, have always been capable of putting on great displays. And um, here is the Palace of the Doges, and St. Mark is behind us, and the Piazza San Marco, and this is the Busentar, the, uh, uh, the uh, boat of the Doge as uh, it returns to, this is called the Molo. And everybody is out on the Grand Canal in their gondolas. Everybody is cel celebrating. Everybody is in uh, their best, uh, in their Sunday best. And uh, the English bought these paintings uh, by dozens. In fact, today, if one goes on a tour to those uh, great uh, English houses, the piles, uh, one often can see Canaletto's there because they were brought to England in great numbers. So here's, and Canaletto was just great at that, he, at just depicting the celebratory mood of Venice. And here's another version of the same, just uh, a little calmer. And it's called the Grand Canal. And here's our Busin tour again uh, with, uh, with gondolas. It's just a little calmer version of the version that we have here. And he painted many, many of them, and, uh, and also of Venice itself, the, uh, the houses and the squares and uh, the bridges of Venice. Um, here is his view of uh, the entrance to the Venetian arsenal that uh, made Venice the, uh, the, one of the first foremost powers in the Middle Ages and uh, Renaissance. Uh, it's in this arsenal that uh, Venetian great fleet was built. It is from here that that fleet uh, sailed uh, out to the east, uh, conquered Constantinople, conquered the eastern Mediterranean, and in fact carved for Venice a veritable empire. And here is the entrance to the arsenal. This is the uh, uh, an image of uh, a winged lion, which uh, is the um, allegory of Saint Mark, who is the patron saint of Venice. Now, the same, uh, the same view is now I'm going to show you, is painted by a very different painter, also a Venetian, whose name is Francesco Boardi. The entrance into the arsenal. This is Canaletto. This is Boardi. A very different style of painting. If Canaletto shows the brilliance of Venice, Guardi 
shows the nostalgia of Venice because uh, Venice in the 18th century still living off its former glory but the glory ended when the Portuguese uh, discovered the route to the Indies. Once the route to the Indies was discovered around uh, the Cape Cod, uh, Venetian monopoly on Eastern trade essentially ended. It will still continue, of course, into the 16th century, but, um, but by the 17th it will be very clear that, uh, that the centers of trade moved elsewhere, particularly 17th century, as we remember, Amsterdam. Uh, the Netherlands and then to England and by the 18th century Venice uh, as the majority of Italy will now live on its former glory still unable to reconcile the present uh, political and financial conditions uh, to them remembering through generations uh, the old days and um, and it is this that uh, Guardi invokes. He is very evocative. Canaletto paints Venice as it is, as you see, just brilliant under the brilliant sun that uh, reflects from uh, the brilliant canals. Guardi, however, is nostalgic and evocative, and he has a nostalgic and evocative brush. So this is, as you see, the same view. Uh, this is something also that uh, Guard did, the, um, the church of um, Santa Maria delle Salute, right here. And just uh, everyday scenes from uh, everyday Venice and what Venice has become in the 18th century. But he was as popular as Canaletto, in fact. And, uh, and his, uh, his nostalgia, his moodiness, his... Um, introspection are very, very, of course, uh, attractive to, particularly to a modern eye who is used to Impressionism. And Guardi is far more Impressionistic, in fact, uh, than, uh, than Canaletto. He gives the immediacy of vision, the immediacy of uh, uh, perception. And now we go to Germany, and this is a stunning residence, and it's called Residence. It is located in Würzburg, here in Würzburg. And um, it was built by Balthazar Newman, who was a court architect, to the bishop, the archbishop of Würzburg, and the principal architect of the residence. And uh, it was commissioned by the prince bishop of Würzburg and his brother in the um, early 18th century, 1720, and completed 20 years later. Uh, the Venetian painter, Gian Battista Tiepolo, assisted by his son, painted the majority of the interiors. Uh, it is a spectacular place. Uh, with going back to Rococo, even though on the outside it's very much, uh, it's almost neoclassical slash Baroque. But once you walk inside, it's an Alibaba cave. Uh, this particular ceiling uh, was painted by the architect himself, Balthazar Newman, right here, and it uh, shows God Apollo riding through the sky in his golden chariot uh, with four white beautiful horses. Everything is done de Soto and Sue with this uh, remarkable perspective from bottom up. Uh, a chapel that's connected to uh, the uh, palace that's all painted by Tiepolo and designed by Newman and this is where Rococo is really obvious. As I said, it's taken from the French word, the uh, okay, which means uh, just great ornamental uh, ideas, uh, decorative ideas of combining shells and pebbles and acanthus leaves and uh, anything and everything together to give us this, uh, this view of, uh, of extraordinary luxury. And here, what you see here, this is the grand staircase. The ceiling is painted by Tiepolo and represents the continents. Uh, as you see here, there's a combination of plaster and painting, so the ceiling is spilling out into our space. And uh, here, for instance, is uh, the, uh, the part of the Tiepolo, and it all is done, as I said, from bottom up. 
Here is again Tiepolo and a lot of representation is dedicated to medieval history of Germany. And uh, this is uh, one of the scenes and that's the marriage of Frederick Barbarossa who was Holy Roman Emperor in the 12th century and uh, he's called Barbarossa because uh, it was ginger. And here it is. Uh, this one is uh, done with a regular perspective, not distorted in Sioux because it's painted on the wall. But all the luxury, uh, the, uh, the plaster painting is here and the plaster sculpting and everything is combined. It's um, an extraordinary space. So here is uh, Tiepolo. Here he, one of the gods is represented and uh, here is uh, one of his drawings and he too was an extraordinary draftsman. Uh, some of the interiors, so these are, this is a Parisian interior, a typical interior of the 18th century. Actually the Metropolitan Museum has uh, some examples of uh, 18th century interiors. Uh, here is the interior of the Meadow Church in Upper Bavaria. Bavaria will very much, just as uh, southern Germany and Bavaria, uh, Bavaria is southern Germany, will very much embrace uh, the Rococo styles in the 18th century and we just go to town with it as you see it here. Well, um, we've come to the end of our lecture, we, we've come to the end of uh, this semester and I wish you wonderful holidays, uh, wonderful Christmas, New Year and um, a winter break. And um, thank you very much, it's been delightful.